Hope you have your Bibles with you. We're in John chapter number 2. We'll be going through John 1, 2, and 3, the first three chapters of John in this series, Come and See. And today we're looking at the first of the miracles of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, if you've been with us or you know the text, John, it's a verbal, John writes, it's a verbal identification of the Messiah. In other words, it's a testimony, it's verbal, here's the Messiah, here's who he is, he is the one who created something from nothing, he is the God-man. Chapter 2 will be the first of his miracles. And then we'll see what we call a visual uh, experience, or an experience of a miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 2, verse number 11, is the crux of this entire message, of this entire text. When we look at a text, we look at a miracle, we look at a parable, there's generally one point that needs to be emphasized. If you're not careful, you'll go on rabbit trails, and you will chase that thing all over the map, and miss the point at which the text is trying to get across or what the Lord is trying to get across through his divine inspiration, the Holy Spirit, as the word of God was penned. Verse number 11, please don't miss this. This is why the miracle was done. This and this reason only. Let's look at it together. This miracle, the turning of water into wine, Verse 11, this is the beginning of miracles did Jesus Christ in Cana of Galilee. You get that? And then he goes on and says, and manifested or revealed forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. I want to preach a message I simply titled this morning, How Christ, let's make it personal now, reveals his glory to us. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the opportunity that you give us. I do pray that you would fill me with the Holy Spirit. I pray for those here this morning that have come to church but not come to Christ, they're not saved, they have never had their sins forgiven. I pray for an understanding and awakening today of the necessity for salvation. I pray you would use this message. Lord, let it speak to each and every one of us. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. We find in the Gospel of John, we find here that Jesus would travel back closely to his hometown that he grew up in. That would be Nazareth. And we will talk about that in a minute. We find that we come to chapter 2. Chapter 1 was all about the verbal testimony of Christ. Chapter 2 starts an alternation of a discourse or discussion or preaching and then a miracle. And we see that through the remainder of the Gospel of John. John is going to alternate the view as we go through the gospel with the works of Christ and the testimony of Christ. And what he will do here, only God could do. He's revealing himself to be God. And if there were no other miracles left in the Bible, this would be enough at least to satisfy the onlookers. We find in John chapter 2, the first miracle. We find another miracle. There will be eight miracles in the Word of God, excuse me, in the Gospel of John. He heals a dying man in chapter 4. He he cures a paralyzed man in chapter 5. He creates food for thousands of people in chapter 6. He walks on water in chapter 6. He gives sight to the blind in chapter 9. He raises a dead man for days in chapter 11. Many of you know these stories. He creates a meal and a breakfast for the disciples out of nothing. And then the miracle of all miracles. We find he raises himself from the dead. A miracle means there's no other way to explain this happening. So we find here there's a change, there's a shift. Here we find that Jesus will turn the water into wine. 
A note about alcohol in the Bible, when strong drink or wine is mentioned in the Bible, the overwhelming references are negative. Only a few instances could it be considered to be neutral. And as with any text, the biblical interpretation will give us the key. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 21, chapter 20, verse number 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. It's been said during biblical times and ancient times, strong drink would only be partaken by barbarians, according to, I believe, Josephus. Proverbs chapter 23 says this, Look not thou upon the wine. This is talking about fermentation, which I will not get into any, any detail. Well, I'll get some detail into that today. When it giveth the color of the cup, when it moveth itself all right. Ephesians 5.18 says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but filled with the Spirit. If I was to line up people in this church, and we were to come one at a time, I guarantee you there's at least 70 to 80 testimonies of something negative that has happened with strong drink. I have it, my wife have it, and almost everyone in this church has it. It's a scourge on society, and the Bible makes it clear regarding that note. As far as the note on alcohol, a, a total abstinence position, some good things will happen when you take the position of abstinence, not drinking any. You'll never have to, it'll never lead you to drunkenness. You'll never wake you up wondering what you said or did. Never will your children use you as an excuse to why they consume it. By the way, what you do in moderation, your children generally do in excess. Absence from alcoholic beverages, I believe, is firmly rooted in what the Bible teaches, especially when it comes to excess consumption of strong drink. Not overlooked, though, is the obvious and well-publicized devastation resulting from the abuse of alcohol in so many homes, including dozens sitting in this room. Dozens. Consumption of alcoholic beverages has become a more persuasive in large part. Since 1950, the average American consumes three times the amount of alcohol the average American consumed in 1950. By the way, try abstinence, or try taking a position and watch how you're called judgmental from other Christians that may partake of alcoholic beverages and other things, and it becomes a real stand that you take. By the way, this text is not about intoxicating beverages. It's not even about wine, and it's not about strong drink. It's about God, glor God glorifying himself in that community. If you take an abstinence position like my wife and I have, and most of the people in this church stand alone and watch. I often go to Auburn football games. I haven't been in a while, but you go to Auburn football game. The last time I was there, I find there was a big drunk party and a football game broke out. And some of you will get that in a minute, but uh, it's almost that way. It's everywhere. It's in our face. It's in front of us. And if we're not careful, it can lead to a sinful lifestyle. So let's look at this text, and we'll walk through this for a little bit. Number one, how does Christ reveal his glory in us? The first point we want to talk about in John chapter 2, verse number 1, is when we are with family and friends. Do not miss this. This is key to understanding this text and how Jesus Christ's ministry began. Do not miss this. Let's look at verse number 1. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Then the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. It was a marriage. Now, we'll look at that. A wedding was a big event back in ancient times, as it is today as well in some circles. It's the most important event in their particular area, a wedding. Verse 1 says, it was the third day they left the Jordan River area, the area of what we call of Judea, to head back to the west across the Jordan River, north the Sea of Galilee, to the city, Hamlet, it wasn't a city, that would be 
uh, speaking uh, very, uh, it, would, it was just a small hamlet of town of Cana. Cana was nine miles to uh, nine miles from Nazareth, which is where Jesus is from, and not too far from the city of Capernaum, where Jesus did the majority of his public ministry. This was an out-of-the-way place, a very sparsely populated place of people that primarily were not of the mainstay of Judaism of that day. This is a very powerful packed week, and they come to the end of that week. Nazareth, for example, as we understand it, at the times of Jesus, would have had no more than 500 people. That's a small place. Cana, which is a small village nine miles away, was even smaller, maybe just 15 to 30 people, so it was really a small gathering place for maybe agricultural folks in that region that they could meet together. Obviously, there'd be people from Nazareth there. There might be people from Capernaum there. There might be people from other small towns. But everybody, look here, they all knew each other. If you've ever come from a small town, everybody knows what everybody else is what? Doing. And that's what was happening here. This was a wedding. This was a big deal. And it's not a surprise that Mary would be at this wedding. You know why? Because Nazareth was just a short distance away, and they obviously had, had, must have known some folks down in Canaan. So this was the group of people that Jesus would minister to. Family and French. Fan, friends, French. Family and friends. And let me just say something, ladies and gentlemen. This is a major event. It lasted for days. It might start in the middle of the week and go on for many days. Sometimes they would start early in the week and go all week long. It was a celebration. Because that particular man, the groom, had been working for one year during what we call the betrothal period to prove to his future in-laws not only that he was justified in marrying the daughter, but he could provide for her. He would build a home. He would have to provide for, to show he could provide for his wedding, possibly in a dowry type of a formation, but we're not going to get into that. Jesus' families, family and friends were there. So he starts his public ministry amongst are with his family and friends. Now, just to back up a minute, at this point, now don't miss this, at this point, Jesus was just the Jesus of Nazareth. 30 years of obscurity. We only hear about him at his birth in age 12. There's no miracles. His public ministry had not begun. So when Jesus shows up, he's just Jesus. There's nothing special about him at this point. And they look at him. Oh, there's some Jesus. All right. Not a big deal, right? It's like the family and friends know him best. So let me just say something to you. How does Christ reveal his glory to us? When we are with family and friends. And your family ought to come first in your life. And that's where you should start with any public ministry that you have with your family, with those closely associated with you. So we start that out. So Jesus shows up. He's invited. It says clearly he's invited to this wedding. It's a great occasion. No occasion like it. There's a celebration. And it's not a drunk fest. We'll talk about that in a minute. Everybody's having a wonderful time. The family is there. Those that knew him best were there. And God will reveal his glory through us when we are with our family and friends. Don't doubt me on this one. Number two, how does God reveal his glory to us? When we are presented with a problem. Now let's look at this quickly. Your family comes with you, to you, 
with the Father. Look at verse 3, please. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, They have no wine. That's a colossal social embarrassment. If there was anything the bridegroom had to spend a year trying to prove as he could take care of the bride, and right out of the gate, there was a failure. He had to build her a house. He had to acquire everything. He had to demonstrate his ability to take care of her for the rest of her life. I know when our children, our girls especially, when they were quote-unquote dating, and I don't say this is, should be the way in your house, it's just what we did when our girls were dating we said we do not talk about the world marriage until at least it's your senior year in college. Do not even bring it up. Don't talk about it. It doesn't exist. I don't mean that's right, and that surely isn't necessarily right for everyone, but I do believe my personal conviction is this idea is that is this is a very immaturity relationship going on in most couples until they, you know, there is something about growing in grace. And so this is somewhat of what is going on here. In other words, there was a year of waiting. Now, I'm not going to tell you there were 22, 23, but that was, that was the case with my children. Anyway, he had to build her a house. He had to acquire everything. He had to demonstrate his ability to take care of her the rest of his life. As I said before, there was a one-year betrothal period. Her father was handing him over to her. Maybe this guy can't plan. You ever met people like that? You go, oh my, I hope they don't take my kids. You know, But I'm just teasing. But the point is, maybe he couldn't plan. So what does he do? He runs out of wine. Wine was a staple drink in the ancient world. They made it from all kinds of fruit, mostly grapes, but other fruit as well. So they fermented. Wine was, so everything to wine, you made it from grapes, you made it from uh, other fruits, and because there was no refrigeration, it would ferment and develop into alcohol. The quench of thirst of water was very, very, very dangerous in that area because the water was not purified. Bacteria, dysentery was there. It was evident in that area through historical writing. But the quench of thirst of wine, especially wine that was fermented, was very dangerous because you could get drunk, and clearly that was a sin. Commentary after commentary after commentary, people who've researched this subject far beyond my knowledge have demanded, have come up with the conclusion that the wine that's referenced here and through the majority of the Bible was diluted to the point sometimes as much as 90%. Say, Pastor, where do you get that? I don't have time to explain all that, but let me give you a fundamental Baptist website it's called drinkwine.com. It's a joke. It's called winespectator.com. Here's an interesting statement I found in doing some research. Alcohol is a natural disinfectant. Today, in water purification, what do we use? We use chlorine. By the way, chlorine is God's gift to save the society. You wouldn't believe if we didn't have chlorine, how many people would not survive? It pretty much brought us into what we call the modern day culture. But alcohol, a natural disinfectant, can reduce microbial activity in water. As a result, history has confirmed it was common for Romans, Greeks, and Jews and other wine-drinking cultures to drink a, mix, a mixture of up to 90% water with 10% wine. Not only did the alcohol clean up the water, but he prevented the people from getting drunk. I don't want to get into the entire exegesis or basically what was going on here as far as the how much was diluted, but it would take a quantum leap of faith to state that the wine that was given there was allowing anyone to be intoxicated. And I'll address the one word that some people get concerned with on that area in just a minute. John MacArthur says the way they dealt with diluted water... The, Excuse me, the way they dealt with this was they diluted the water with 90%, up to 90% wine, down to three, and sometimes down to three quarters, 70% of water. They did this so they could drink the water because it had been purified. They could drink the wine. If they drunk the wine, it would make them drunk. 
And do not doubt me on this. This was not a seven-day drunk fest. If all it was was having a wedding and pouring wine into people's life, that doesn't line up with anything we find in the Scripture. So why did Jesus go there? His public ministry had not started. So why did he go? He was invited. He started it at Cana. Don't miss this. So we find that. Interesting, we find that in verse number 3 through 5, let's read it through. It says, they wanted wine. The mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. That's a crisis. Verse number 4, Jesus said unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Now that word woman, in our culture, that would be somewhat of a, not a very endearing term to say to your mother. But it was not a term, it was almost like the word, the southern word, man. It was not an endearing term, per se, but it was making a difference between Jesus Christ's previous ministry and now he's on his own. And he's making a distinct separation there. Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour has not come. It's interesting. When the wine ran out, everybody knew the wine was gone. So why did Mary come to her? Well, why not? She had raised him. He hadn't, necess- he hadn't done necessarily any miracles, public miracles, but everything he had done, by the way, he had always come up with Wonderful solutions, no doubt, in here, raising of this of Jesus Christ. Because he's telling her we don't longer, they, but he is saying here with this text, we no longer have that relationship. There's a problem here. We're out of food. Being the staple drink of wine. We're out. There's no wine. She's no longer in a position to act as authority. She's no longer in a position to tell him what to do, but she is making a suggestion here. She's not even telling to perform a miracle. Just tell us what to do. Look what he says. What have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not come. So we find when we are presented with a problem, what are we to do? We're going to glorify Christ. How does Christ reveal his glory in us? It's because generally when we are presented with a problem. We have it, do we not? Look here. Everybody look here. What's the problem you're doing? How do you handle it? Life is full of problems. How do you present and glorify God through the problems, especially with your family? He called her woman because he's telling her we no longer have the same relationship we've had up to now. It's over. Still respect. By the way, that same term was used when he was on the cross as well. She's no longer in a position to act as authority. She's no longer in a position to tell him what to do. But she's letting him know of the problem. Number three. So how does Christ reveal his glory in us? When we witness the provision. Now think about this. Christ is called to Canaan. Christ and his disciples at that time was Peter, Andrew, and John, at least those who were identified there in this text. We know there were others. And they went all the way up to Canaan amongst famine, and they were major problems. So what do we do? How do we glorify God? We glorify God when we witness the provision. Something's going to happen here. Now let's look through this text. It's really interesting, and we'll go through it. There were six water pots of stone. Look what it says. Interesting. And there were, there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying the Jews. Now here's what happened. The Jews had ceremonial washings. This was a wedding, so there was some ceremonial cleaning that was taking place when they would wash their hands, wash themselves. It was a cleaning. There were six water pots there, and it says there in verse number six, containing two or three 
firkins apiece. A firkin, according to those who studied this, is about nine gallons. So we're talking maybe 120 gallons there. How about this? Go tell your wife that you're out of milk. Go please pick up a couple of firkins for the kids. So they were out of wine. They found these containers there. Jesus saith to them, said unto them, fill the water pots with water. Got 120 to 180 gallons of water. That water that those water pots were not used for drinking. When you put water in them, that was not drinkable water either or either according to the culture of that time because of dysentery, bacteria, or whatever. There's no cultural basis to ever say that was consumed. So they filled them to the brim, which is what he wanted. He asked them to draw it out and take it to what we call the head waiter. Now look what he said. He says in verse number 8, draw out now and bear it under the governor, and they bear it. In other words, they brought him the wine. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, and the governor of the feast, he called the bridegroom here, the guy that was the bad guy at the beginning. So he brought out wine. Now look at the next verse. And he said unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine for now. Now there's a cultural basis in which you interpret that. Be careful. Let the Bible interpret the Bible, not your cultural basis. Here's what I've heard people say. Well, Jesus waited till they were totally plastered, gave them good wine so they could drink more, and what he's saying to them is, this is what I've heard and what you've heard, and maybe a casual reading of that scripture, you will interpret this, and what Jesus is saying is, most people, they wait until everybody's plastered or inebriated, then they bring out the bad stuff. But you brought out the good stuff at the end. Be careful before you come up with that position. Let's go through it and look a little more detail. When we witness the provision, the miracle was, is Christ was providing the necessary, quote-unquote, wine out of nothing. Zero, not a nothing. It came, it was a miracle that only God could do. One commentator said this, I like it. How do you get wine? Grapes. How do you get grapes? Vines. How do you get vines? Seeds. How do you get seeds? Other vines. How do you make vine grow? The vine grows. Sunlight, water, and earth. How do you get wine? You crush and you strain. In this text, there's no grapes, there's no vines, there's no seeds, no sunlight, no water, no earth, nothing. He created wine out of nothing. John MacArthur says this, and I like it. And by the way, this would have been unfermented wine, just the sort that bypassed the curse. It bypassed the earth, the vine, the grapes, and everything. This was the best wine ever. It was an Eden kind of wine. Unfermented. Unfermented. And it becomes right, apparent right away that something has happened here. Now it's like this. Look at the next, verse number 10. And he said, Then it saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, they, that which is worse, but that was kept the good wine till now. It's like this. Let me give you an example. I heard this. I thought it really ties in real. How many of you, now please answer correctly, how many of you have ever had anybody over for dinner? Raise your hand. Okay, if you haven't, then shame on you. But we've all had somebody for dinner, right? When we have people over for dinner, we usually prepare a meal. Is that right? Come on, are we awake or what? Yes, of course. We prepare a meal. Now, we prepare a meal. We prepare what is there. And let's say you had a couple over and you prepared the meal for them and they ate it all. All of it. And then they said to you, don't miss this, 
I'm still hungry. First of all, I would wonder how close of a friend is that? So let's say they're still hungry. So what you do is you go into your refrigerator and you start pulling out leftovers. Is that correct? You pull out the leftovers and they start eating that. Now, you would not have invited them over and given them the leftovers first and after they ate the leftovers, then give them the meal, would you? So in other words, it's natural that you would give the good stuff first and secondly, there's a point to this. I hope you're connecting the dots. Some of your light bulbs are starting to go off. I can see it. Others, you are saying it's 1149. When is it going to be done? Anyway, so the point is, you would not serve leftovers first. You would serve your meal first. That's, that's natural. But what we're finding here, this was sweet Eden-type wine they'd never tasted. This was not the barbarian stuff that they referenced earlier. It was not only wine, it was the best wine they'd ever consumed. Unfermented, delicious, nothing like man had ever tasted. This was directly and divinely given by God. It's amazing how that happened. Now look at verse number 11. So here is the crux of this entire message. Not that he created something from nothing, but he created something from nothing so he would reveal his glory amongst their presence. Don't miss this. Look at verse 11. This is the beginning of miracles. It's not about the wine or the water or the wedding and all that. It's about him revealing who he is that only God could have done this. In Cana of Galilee. And manifested his glory and the disciples believed on him. The purpose of this miracle is the disciples believe. Everybody look at me. We have a family. It's your family. Your family's going to have a problem. And God will be glorified by the provision. Maybe some of you have run out of hope. Some of you have run out of money. Your relationship is bad. You've run out of patience. Some of you, it's you're out of your health. is awful. And I'm not saying God's going to be glorified because all of those are going to work out the way you want them to work out. But God will be glorified with the provision. We see that. In the last part of the verse, his disciples believed on him. So what happened there? Jesus comes strolling into Cana. They're presenting a problem. And it's pretty big. And it's a phenomenal miracle. And God gets the glory. That is when we witness provision we glorify God, how Christ reveals his glory to us. Let's all stand together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we stand together, please?